Good morning. Glad you managed to make it, Olga. It's good. Uh, we had a great time with the, the kids yesterday at Liverpool. And we even had some teenagers called Steve and Sheila join us. It was uh, great to see them in their prime. And David done an incredible job of uh, teaching yesterday. And the other side to it, the worst thing about having teenagers staying with you is you have to stay up late in that pool, don't you? So David kept me up quite late last night, so uh, but we'll survive, we'll survive. <laughs> we are uh, finishing up our study today, or our sermon series on the Holy Spirit. And just a quick recap on the first one, we identified who this Holy Spirit was. He's God, he is eternal, he has the characteristics of God, he's not an active force, he's not some divine fluid, he is a person. Uh, and that was very important, I think, to get that laid out in the, at the very start because of, in the religious world there's a lot of confusion concerning who the Holy Spirit is. Second, when we looked at the work of the Holy Spirit, remember he came to convict the world of sin, righteousness and judgment and he still does that to this very day every time the word of God is proclaimed. We do not convict anybody of anything. It's the word of God that does the convicting. And that's how the Holy Spirit still works in that way today. We also went on to look at the gift of the Holy Spirit in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. That should be up on the screen. There we go. Uh, we saw that the, the gift is not miraculous. It was the gift of the Holy Spirit himself that all Christians, all people who are obedient to the gospel of Jesus, those who have been baptized, received the gift of the three uh, uh, of God's free gift to us and we also saw in many passages that the Bible tells us that just as the Father dwells in us the, uh, Jesus dwells in us so does the Holy Spirit and that should have an impact in our lives and the way that we live our lives last week we looked at the purpose of the Holy Spirit and we when we're talking about purpose we're talking about his purpose for us the real life application in our lives and so when we go through really difficult times, he's there to comfort us. Just as the Father comforts us, and Jesus comforts us. And he also speaks to God on our behalf. When we talk about it, you get these moments when you're so low, and you don't know what to say to God. You want to pray, but you can't find the words. It's then the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, and prays to God on our behalf. And he takes a, a weakness, if you wish, when we can't uh, uh, pray and turns them into something useful and then ultimately the main reason why God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit is because he wants to transform us into the image of his son David and I were chatting yesterday about the, the Romans 8 28 passage and he quoted it and I said to him never ever ever read that verse on its own read the next verse that talks about the purpose of all things working good for those who are in Christ Jesus and then it goes on to talk about the purpose is because he's transforming in the likeness of his son, Jesus. That's the purpose behind it. So today we're going to look at what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And a little later we're going to look at, is it possible to lose the Holy Spirit? Uh, so that's the two aspects that we're going to look at today. I remember a, a story I got told of many, many years ago about this church in the Highlands of Scotland. And they used to have a, like a, what they called back then a, a revival meeting. You remember revival meetings? I'm asking Tony and Stephen because they're ancient of days. They will remember that far back. Uh, I'm not asking the young people like, like Jill and Mary and things. Uh, but revival meetings were, were incredible events that happened many, many years ago. And they would go on for maybe a week or two weeks time, one day after another. There was big meetings. But up here in the Highlands, there was this guy, an old man, who would come back to God every spring. And so he would be hot all the way through the summer and he'd be kind of cool off a little bit in the autumn and by the winter time he'd get cold and just drop out. But every single spring when revival time came again he got all fired up and so on the first night of the revival he's sitting there on the back seat. The next night he's moved up two rows. By the fourth or fifth night he's up near the front and he's shouting, fill me Lord, fill me. And an old lady that knew him well said, Careful, Lord, he leaks. 
And that's not a problem we all face. We all tend to leak. God fills us up with the Holy Spirit. He starts that fire in our hearts. But after time, that fire just doesn't burn as bright as it used to at the very beginning. I mean, you read about the spiritual vibrancy of the early church. You sometimes wonder, well, why can life like not be like that today? Not just for the church as a whole in, in the book of Acts, but for individuals. You know, people were actively doing things, and things were on fire, if you want to use that term. Well, remember, when a person is baptized, they receive the gift of forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit as a gift from God. And Ephesians tells us it's the Holy Spirit who acts as our seal, who acts as our deposit, who acts as our guarantee of heaven. Now, I made a bold statement a couple of weeks ago uh, when we were talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it's, again, it's bold, but I'm going to repeat it. If a person has never been immersed in the water for the forgiveness of their sins, they are still in their sins. If a person has never been immersed in the water, they've never received the forgiveness of sins and they've never received the gift of the Holy Spirit, regardless of what people claim. That's what the Bible says. Now here's the thing with this Ephesian passage. Notice that the Holy Spirit is our guarantor. He's our guarantee of eternal life. And so again, if, if we haven't got the Holy Spirit, You've got no guarantee of eternal life. You see how it all links together? And so, again, if a person has never been immersed into Christ, there's no forgiveness of sins, there's no Holy Spirit, there's no guarantee of heaven. That's what the Bible says. And so, we go on a little bit to, to uh, Romans 8, 13. We see that there's Holy Spirit who helps and protects us. He protects us against tampering and, and protects us against attack. And ultimately, when we get the gift of the Holy Spirit at our, at our uh, baptism, it's the Holy Spirit who then identifies us as God's children. Now, when you wrap all that together, what we're seeing here is, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, <laughs> you don't have salvation, you've got no hope of heaven, and you're not God's child. See, people could claim to do miracles and speak in languages and do all these wonderful things. They could claim all they wish. But it's contrary to what the Bible says, isn't it? And we know that God and his word doesn't lie. It's either one or the other. So, in a very real sense, God's spirit protects us. He guarantees uh, eternity with Jesus. But we need to understand that there is a huge difference between the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now remember, every person who's obedient to the gospel uh, is, is going to receive the Holy Spirit. That's the promise we see in Scripture. But not every person in the Bible was filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's go ahead and look at the first part here, being filled with the Holy Spirit. I remember a, f a few months ago on, on Facebook, and maybe some of you saw it, somebody sent me a bunch of a little video clips of this university thing. Uh, and they, they said that these were Christians that were being filled with the Spirit. Now, when you look at the videos, you see that there was people crying over here. There was people dancing over here. There was people singing over there. There was people throwing themselves all over the floor. I mean, it, it was just chaotic. And on social media, people were writing comments and saying, oh, we're praising God for, send, for sending his spirit among you. I'm thinking, really? Really? I want to suggest to you that this is not what the Bible describes as being filled with the spirit. Notice here, Paul says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, here's the first note. Who's Paul writing to? The Ephesians. The Ephesians. And who are they? Christians. Yeah? They are Christians. This is important to remember. We must remember they're already Christians. They already had 
the Holy Spirit as a gift. And notice also the instruction to be filled with the Spirit isn't optional. It's not something we can just give or take. It's imperative here. But unlike a conversion, you know, we, 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 it's unrepeatable. In other words, we can't be born again and again and again and again and again, yeah? But being filled with the Spirit is a continual process throughout our lives. It's like we talked about last time, remember, to grow in Christ, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a continual growth. And here is the same thing. And so we're literally to keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. But being filled with the Spirit isn't something that automatically happens to us. It's not something that we're suddenly going to get up one Sunday morning and say, God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. It's not going to happen that way. God doesn't send that, that, that type of thing. It's something that we are responsible for as individuals, as we cooperate with God who's working in us and through us. And so let me ask you this. How does a person get drunk on wine? By drinking. But how much drinking? By continually drinking. Yeah? A person gets drunk by continually drinking wine. And so we become filled with the Spirit in the same way that somebody gets filled with wine. We continually drink the Spirit. But how is this spiritual drinking done? How, how is that done? Well, like a, uh, a couple of examples that Jesus gave. He said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So how do we hunger and how do we thirst for righteousness? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure you've experienced hunger. And I'm pretty sure you've experienced uh, thirst. But you also know that even when you're absolutely exhausted, you're not going to rest until you satisfy that craving for food and drink. You're not going to rest. The point that Jesus is making is this is that we are to pursue righteousness, doing the will of God, with the same determination of a person who's pursuing food and drink. And that's why we all need an appetite for spiritual things. And we demonstrate, we demonstrate that whole thing by exposing ourselves to the will of God through our personal readings of the scripture, through prayer, through times like this, and through Bible study. That's a demonstration of hunger and, 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 and being thirsty. Stephen King read a scripture reading a couple of times, so I won't read it again, but in John 7, 37, 38, here we see that Jesus is discussing the spirit-filled life here, but people, well, Jesus invites people to come to him and notice and drink. But who are the thirsty? And how, how do they drink? Well, the thirsty are those who've got a desire to live for Jesus. They want his will done in their life. They desire to do the will of God here on earth as it is in heaven. And so they come to Jesus to drink, and from within them, streams of living water, which is a reference to the power of the Holy Spirit working in people's lives. And though the intake may be small, the output is incredible, isn't it? It's like streams of living water flowing from them. You see, this is the Spirit giving a, a super abundant display of His presence in their lives. And so, when we are filled with the Spirit to such an extent that we allow Him to influence our lives. That's what he's talking about. We yield to the Spirit's gentle movement in our hearts. Paul later says, I want you to walk by the Spirit. He says, I want you to be led by the Spirit. In Galatians, again, he says, we need to bear the fruit of the Spirit. We need to live by the Spirit. We need to keep in step with the Spirit. You see the reason for all of these? You see, the Holy Spirit isn't just a, a deposit that's guaranteed for heaven. He's an active part of our life and he's trying to work in us and work with us. 
The question is, are we working with him? Or are we two steps ahead? Or two steps behind? Are we working with him? At his pace? So that he can do what he needs to do in our lives? You know, whoever has ears, let me hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, when we read what the Spirit wrote, and we hear what the Spirit says, and we do what the Spirit reveals, it's then that we're continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what happens. That's what filled with the Holy Spirit only really means. Now, what happens if we don't listen to the Holy Spirit? What happens if we decide, you know what, forget it, I'm just going to do my own thing. And you're just going to totally ignore the Holy Spirit. Well, what happens then? Well, in our back garden, uh, we've got a water feature and a light display that both run off solar panels. The water feature, as you can imagine, runs all day long and it will keep tipping out water all day long as the sun is shining. And then it goes off at night. And then the light display comes on at night and goes off in the morning. Now what makes these things work? What's the source of their power? The sun. The sun. The sun is the source. They collect power from the sun, which then generates power for them to work throughout the day, and they're the one to work at night. But here's the thing. They won't work without any power source. They won't work. And what happens if they decide, you know what, I'm going to go home and put them in the shed? It's not going to, it's not going to work, isn't it? But it's the same way in the life of the Christian. Unless we allow the power of the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, then the Holy Spirit in our lives becomes useless. I've often said, and in fact I've said it, well, I speak to David about it, that you know, the Lord's church is like a sleeping giant. It's so powerful, and yet we sleep our way into eternity. Why? Because we have got no idea the power that God has given us as Christians. We have got no idea the power the Holy Spirit has given us as individuals. And because we don't understand, or nobody wants to talk about the Holy Spirit, what happens? He gets put in a shed. Christian, you are way more powerful than you'll ever imagine. I'm not just talking about you, I'm talking about because of who is in you. Because who is working through you. Charles Spurgeon once said, Without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are ships without the wind, branches without sap, and like coals without fire, we are useless. And he's absolutely bang on the button there. We are useless. Paul says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Paul says, When we do something that's contrary to, to, the, to the things of the Holy Spirit, when we allow sin to, to dominate our lives and we stop him working on our lives, he says, guys, you need to know you're grieving the Holy Spirit. You're hurting him. He wants so much to help. He wants so much to strengthen. He wants so much to turn you into the image of Jesus. But every time we just do our own thing and live in sin instead, he's grieving. Why? Because he sees the potential. <laughs> I can see potential in people, but let me tell you something. Nobody sees potential like the Spirit does. He sees it in each and every one of us. The second thing I want to talk about is losing the Holy Spirit. Because this is another topic that, that uh, people are, are, are a little bit far-fetched with. I personally believe if a person continues to ignore the Holy Spirit and grieve him, then the Holy Spirit will leave that person. Now you might say to me, well, wait a minute, mate, where does it say that in the Bible? Well, you're not going to find a specific Bible verse, but what you will find is applications. Many verses imply that is what's going to happen. Just cast your mind back to, to David in Psalm 51. Notice what he says. He says, do not cast away from me your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. You'll notice the word holy is in small. Holy Spirit, the phrase Holy Spirit is only mentioned three times in the Old Testament and every time it's a small H. 
Now that's a different topic for another day. But it's an interesting one anyway. But this passage appears to teach that a person can lose the Holy Spirit. But we must remember to keep things in their context. The Holy Spirit didn't dwell in believers like he does today. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit didn't dwell in anybody. Yeah? But what happened was his presence was in the life of an individual for a period of time. That's what we see happening. And so David's prayer to retain was not the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit's anointing for his rule. In other words, David's saying, I know I've been anointed through the Holy Spirit to rule. And he's saying, God, don't take that anointing away from me. Don't take my right to rule away from me. That's what he's talking about there. So it's a different thing altogether. But think about this. If a Christian falls from grace, and no, that's another topic that people say, oh no, Christians can't fall from grace. Well, yes they can. And if they can fall from grace, then surely the Holy Spirit won't stay where he's not welcome. Surely the Holy Spirit is not going to stay where he's not having any influence on a person's life. You know, the Bible tells us in 1 John 3.10 that a true believer can't continue to practice sin as a lifestyle. You can't do it. You can't have your cake and eat it, as they say, in the world. Now notice the Hebrew passage, I want to read this one. He said, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God on their foot? Who has cheated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has <laughs> insulted the spirit of grace? Incredible warnings here, isn't it? You see, if you've got a person who is deliberately or willfully, some translations use it, living in sin, and that person refuses to repent, then according to what's read, that person's salvation has to be questioned, doesn't it? Has to be questioned. If you've got a person who's willfully living in sin and they refuse to repent, then they are insulting the Holy Spirit. Remember the importance of the, the tent of meeting and the, the temple built by Solomon? Remember God's presence was there during the night and he was there during the night with the cloud and the fire, the day and night. That was his presence. When Israel turned away from God and the people were carried away into Babylonian captivity, Ezekiel saw a vision depicting God's spirit leaving the temple and then later leaving Jerusalem. Now, I don't think it's far stretched of our imagination to believe that the Holy Spirit can leave a Christian similar to the way this God's Spirit left the temple. I want to suggest to you that it's, it's, you know, if somebody has become a Christian and they just totally carry on life as normal, I don't think God's Spirit will stay there. I want to suggest that it's not so much that the Holy Spirit leaves a person, but it's that person who leaves them. It's, you know, who can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Except me. Yeah? Demons powers, authorities, nothing can separate me from the love of God except me. I can walk away. And it's the same concept getting taught here. Now look at this passage in Hebrews. It's impossible for those who have been once enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away Wait a minute, can't have fallen away. You're not allowed to fall away, according to some people. But anyway, he says it there. And to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain often 
uh, falling on it and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessings of God. But the land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burnt. <clears throat> Let me say this as plain as I can. There is no such thing as once saved, always saved. No such thing. And sadly, a lot of people are believing that. In fact, I was going to America a few years ago and I sat down to this guy and he's the first guy I'd ever met who actually honestly believes in once saved, always saved. And I just said to him, that's an incredible thought, isn't it? He says, yeah. I said, so I could just live however I want. He says, yeah. And I was like, wow. Are you not just undermining, crucifying the Son of God all over again? Is that not what you're doing? You see, if I was to ask, if I believed that God would leave a Christian, I would say no. But what we just read here is that the Holy Spirit will not remain in anyone who continue to ignore his promptings. The Hebrew writer, remember in its context, is describing somebody who has left God, somebody who once was a Christian, but now they have fallen away. So don't tell me it's, it's, it's impossible to fall away, because the Bible says otherwise. And so, would you stay in a place where you're totally ignored? Would, would, would you stay in a place where you've got absolutely no influence? In a person's life? Of course you wouldn't. Common sense tells us that the Holy Spirit will cease to live in that person because the Holy Spirit is being ignored. And he's got no more influence in their life. Now don't ask me, well, at what point does that happen? Because I don't know. All I know is, like Israel, if you continue to sin, God will leave. If you continue to ignore what he says, God will will leave. And so as I pray we continue to appreciate the free gift of God, the Holy Spirit himself. I pray we never forget to give him thanks for what he's revealed to us through his word. I pray for that. I pray that we, we never neglect to study his word because without the Holy Spirit we would know nothing about the Holy Spirit and we would know nothing about the Father and His Son. And we always remember what He's done in our lives. I'm hoping and praying that through this little series, we get a little glimpse of what He's trying to do, and what He is doing, and what He will continue to do if we remain faithful. I will pray that we allow Him to speak boldly through the Word, to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. I pray we'll continue to allow him to comfort us in our times of weakness and pray on our behalf when we can't find the words to say. And more importantly, I pray we will allow him to transform us so that each of us look more and more like Jesus today than we did yesterday. That's my prayer. And if the Holy Spirit has been teaching us anything these past five weeks, it's simply this. Believe in me. That's what he wants us to know. Believe in me. He wants us to use him. Not just in times of weakness, but other times. And he wants, we need to let, or let me use you, let the Holy Spirit use you. That's part of the reason why he's given us these gifts. Remember we talked about there are gifts but they're not from the Holy Spirit, but they're not miraculous. Yeah, giving, teaching, encouraging, all that sort of stuff. Allow him to use you in a powerful way. So let me leave you with this verse from Paul. May the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace as you trust him so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May God bless you all. I pray it's been useful. I pray you've learned at least one thing over the last five weeks. And most importantly, I pray we put these things into practice. And then, then, watch God work 
to each and every one of us that we give thanks unto. God bless.